Hi everyone, today I'm going to be recommending some of my favorite science fiction books from a lifelong fantasy reader. If you've been following my channel for the last few months, you might have seen me review a lot of science fiction and you might have gotten the idea that I'm some kind of big science fiction reader, but honestly it's been a pretty small percent of what I've read for most of my life. A lot of my favorite books are fantasy, a lot of my favorite science fiction books are more on the light side, I mean they are more like science fantasy or space opera rather than really complex science fiction, so if that's the kind of thing that you are interested in, hopefully these recommendations will be good for you. I'm calling this video science fiction recommendations from a fantasy reader, not science fiction recommendations for a fantasy reader because I have no idea what kind of fantasy reader you are, but these are all books that I really love. So first off, I want to recommend the Vorkosigan Saga by Lois McMaster Bujold. I have a few of them here, and here's one more. Uh, there's a lot more than this. It's a pretty long series. Several of these are bind-ups of multiple volumes in the series. Please don't get put off by the bad 1980s era covers. These are really good books. So like I said, this is one of my all-time favorite series. Maybe it's my all-time favorite series. The series is more of a space opera type of science fiction. There is a large and lovable cast of characters. The stories are really quite witty, like it's not full on humor, but I end up laughing a lot while I'm reading these books. It's a very long running series. I haven't reread the most recent ones so much, although they were fine, I didn't love them as much, but I would say there are a good, like maybe nine books in the series that are absolutely stunning. Miles Vorkosigan, the main character for most of the series, is from a planet with a highly militaristic culture where the army is the traditional path, especially for the upper class, but he was born with some physical disabilities, so he is not able to follow that traditional path to success. However, he is brilliant, a little bit manic, and a natural leader who has this knack for drawing the people around him into crazy situations and plans that tend to eventually work out in his favor, although maybe not the way he originally intended. He also has a very famous father who was previously the regent for the emperor, so that shadow looms large over him and he's always trying to find a way to sort of make his name and prove himself. Unfortunately, he also ends up in the intelligence services where pretty much everything that he does is anonymous. The first few books in the series are more in the vein of traditional military or adventure science fiction, but later on the series takes kind of a hard turn into more of a mystery element as Miles evolves as a character and changes career paths multiple times. There's even one of the later books, which is probably my favorite that I would describe as more of a comedy of manners set during a royal wedding. Despite all those styles sounding really different, the tone of the series and the characters is actually overall really cohesive and you really get to know and love a lot of the characters. I really highly recommend this series whether or not you're a science fiction reader or even if you haven't read a ton of genre fiction. I think there's something here that will appeal to a lot of people. There are two places you could start this series. The first book with Miles in it is called The Warrior's Apprentice and that is pretty straightforward. It follows him as he fails out of the physical trials to get into the army and ends up on his own adventure trying to figure out what he's doing with his life. The other place you could start the series is with a book that is from the point of view of Miles' mother Cordelia. It's called Shards of Honor and so it's about how Miles' parents meet and fall in love and a lot of the political stuff that's going on around that. So that book follows a female lead and a slightly older characters, so it's a little bit different, but they are both great books and they're both great places to start. And no matter which one you start with, I recommend reading them both at some point. Next we have Gideon the Ninth. I know I've talked about this one a lot recently, as have a lot of other people, so I won't go super in-depth on it. You can check out my review or someone else's review if you want to know a lot more about the plot. I would describe it more probably as science fantasy than anything else. There are different kinds of necromancers in this book, and it's portrayed as kind of a science in terms of there's a lot of discussion of formulas and techniques and things like that that the characters are using and it's sort of portrayed in a scientific way, but also 
Some characters seem to have a gift for it and others don't, which makes it more magical. There are spaceships and a galactic empire, but most of it takes place in a single location on a haunted planet. So yeah, this is, I would probably term it somewhere between space opera and science fantasy. This is another book that is very funny, dark, witty, and it's not going to be for everyone, but I really loved it. Next, I would like to recommend the Finder series by Suzanne Palmer. This is a series that's new to me. There are two books out so far, and I liked both of them. This isn't necessarily one of my favorite series of all time, but I just really solidly enjoyed it, and it does a lot of things that I like. It follows the adventures of Fergus Ferguson, who is basically an intergalactic repo man, or a finder. So in the first book, which is called Finder, he is on a very distant planet, um, trying to reclaim a spaceship that was stolen, but he gets mixed up into a bunch of nasty political stuff on the ground. And then in the second book, he is trying to rescue some kidnapped friends. So what I liked about this, although he is a relatively typical detective character in some ways, in that he is pretty bad at dealing with his own personal stuff, he is not so hard-boiled. Like, he definitely cares about people and tries to do the right thing without being super soft, but he's overall a nice person who tends to get mixed up in things that he shouldn't and is good at getting himself out of them, but often at some sort of personal cost. I think this series has good and colorful supporting characters. It's basically space opera. There are spaceships, there are some aliens, but there's nothing too complex or fancy here. They are basically straight up adventure, mystery, detective thrillers, something along those lines. So if that's the kind of book you like and you enjoy these kinds of series, then I really recommend checking out this one. I haven't heard too much about it from other people, but there are two volumes out so far, and I'm really looking forward to the author continuing this series. The next thing I want to recommend is also a series. It is the Company series by Cage Baker. I haven't talked about this series too much. Actually, I don't think I've ever mentioned it on this channel because it's something I read quite a long time ago and I did not love how it ended, but I think overall I still have pretty fond feelings towards it and there is a lot that I think it does well. The premise of this series is that in the future, eternal life gets discovered but it basically works by turning children into cyborgs, and it's also incredibly expensive. So that's kind of useless because most people don't want to get turned into a cyborg or they're not compatible, so that seems like kind of useless technology. At the same time, uh, Dr. Zeus Inc., also known as the company, discovers time travel, there are some serious limitations on time travel, however, just like there always are. So in this case, time travel can only go back into the past, and it can't go any further than back into the present. Also, time travel cannot change any of recorded history. I can't remember if it's explained why that's the case. So basically, uh, the company finds this loophole, which is they can get super rich by going and exploiting all the things that have been lost to recorded history. So their operatives do things like save famous artifacts from shipwrecks, or maybe like the Great Library of Alexandria, or they take genetic samples of extinct plants and creatures and then bring them back to life through science in the 24th century, which is when that future stuff is happening. But unfortunately, time travel is also incredibly expensive. So what they decide to do is go back all the way to the dawn of history and start turning the locals, or whatever you want to call them, into these immortal cyborgs that can do their work for them. So they're basically, they're not quite slaves, but they have this whole group of people that have been made immortal and are supposed to be working for them throughout history in order to supposedly get this payoff when they live up through history into the 24th century. And these cyborgs who were generally converted as children have basically all the knowledge of history up through the 24th century. So they're very uh, cultured, very contemporary. They like a lot of pop culture. And as you can tell, it's not like the most serious series. The main plots deal with the cyborgs. There are a few main characters in some of the different books and they're dealing with their missions and what it's like to be immortal. The plots tend to run a little bit towards the absurd the first book is called In the Garden of Eden, and it's about 
a young cyborg Mendoza who is, she's 18, she's out on her first mission, and she has been sent to England in the time of Queen Mary, the older sister of Queen Elizabeth. So obviously there's a lot of religious and political nastiness going on. It's also her first time since she was a little kid being around humans, and so she has a lot to deal with in that. I think my favorite book in this series is probably the one that's called Mendoza and Hollywood, which is set in Los Angeles in 1862, where a bunch of cyborgs are doing some basically cultural and um, botany work in California. And of course, because they have access to all of human culture, they are all huge movie junkies, but there is literally nothing in Los Angeles in 1862. There are a few people, but it's basically barren. So there's a lot of the book that is about them sort of running their own little movie festival when they get bored and talking about where Hollywood is going to be and all sorts of stuff like that. And also the, the main plot is really about how all these different cyborg characters are dealing with immortality and their relationships with humans and stuff like that. But it's just, I don't know. I. I thought that was very funny. Other than the plot of each book, there are some overarching plots to the series that involve some endgame stuff, some different factions that are warring across time and stuff like that. Like I said, I didn't love how this series got wrapped up. There's some weird stuff that kind of happened in the last few books, but I still think this is a good and probably underrated series, and I recommend checking out at least a few of them, probably the first few. Next, I want to recommend the Oxford Time Travel series by Connie Willis. This series doesn't even officially have a name. There are three books in it. The first one is Doomsday Book. The second one is Upside Down, but it's To Say Nothing of the Dog. The third one I don't own physically. It's called Blackout All Clear. So these books are set in a relatively near future where time travel, again, has been invented and it's used by historians to go back and study stuff but there's a whole set of rules about what they can and can't do. And in general, history in this series tries to protect itself and prevent paradoxes. So this means a lot of the times the historians don't end up exactly where they were trying to because there has been slippage because of history or time trying to prevent some sort of paradox. So they end up in some other place doing some other thing instead. So that leads to some absurd situations. In general, Connie Willis, not just in this series, really portrays um, a lot of the absurdities of human nature, a lot about bureaucracy and miscommunication and things like that. I think a lot of her plots have had to do with that kind of thing. So the first book in the series is Doomsday Book, uh, in which a young historian gets sent back in time and accidentally ends up in the Black Plague. Well, at the same time, a flu pandemic is taking place in the modern world. This is maybe a little too timely to read right now. I actually just bought this copy though. Um, but so this book is a little darker in tone. And then the second book in the series is, again, upside down, but to say nothing of the dog, this is a more humorous, more mystery type story set in Victorian times. It's a bit of a parody of the Victorian novel with a lot of Dorothy Sayers references as well. This one is really fun. I, this was the first one I read. I think it's actually a good place to start the series, even though it's a little bit different than the other ones. The third book in the series, it's actually two books that were, well, it was one book that was split into two. So it's in two volumes that were published separately. That one is set during World War II. And I think the first book and the, the first book and the third book have more characters in common and some threads across them. Uh, to say nothing of the dog is kind of on its own. So there is a bit of a range in tone and style between the books, um, but there are cameos across all of them. I really like this series a lot. It is a good mix of funny and serious, and there are some very emotional things in it, despite some of the underlying absurdity. I think I would barely characterize these as science fiction, other than that there's time travel that is supposedly science, and there are some rules for how that's supposed to work. I don't know what else I'd call them, but this is this kind of science fiction I like a lot of the time. It's officially categorized as science fiction, but it might as well be fantasy or just history with time traveling characters. Another book I'd like to recommend is Sundiver by David Brin. This is the first book in his Uplift saga. I will admit, I've actually, I think I read one more book in this series, 
but the first one really stands on its own. It's science fiction, but it is pretty much a traditional mystery. The series is set in a universe where there are a ton of intelligent alien species that have recently discovered humanity. However, each species was raised to intelligence or uplifted by another, even older species. So humans are actually the only species that they've found in the universe that somehow apparently came to sentience on their own. And this is sort of a hot topic of debate where some people think there must have been aliens that did it at some point in the past and other people are claiming that humans really did originate on their own. But the thing that complicates all of this is that by the time humans have been discovered by alien, humans have already started to uplift chimpanzees and dolphins. So they have become a patron race without ever really being a client race, which is sort of the order of things in the rest of the galaxy is that each new race is supposed to be a client of the race that uplifted it for, you know, millennia or probably even longer than that in sort of galactic time. So there's a lot of conflict between the role that humans play in this new broader universe and then the other races not really liking them very much. So Sundiver is a pretty snappy, straightforward mystery. In the series in general, the main characters are humans, but also you have uplifted chimpanzees and uplifted dolphins. I'm pretty sure this concept of uplift has been used in other science fiction since then, but I'm pretty sure David Brin is the one that really originated it or made it popular. Don't quote me on that, I could be wrong. But yeah, I think in the main series, a lot of the characters are dolphins. In this first book, I don't think there are any important dolphin characters. Sundiver is set a little bit before the rest of the series. I would like to read the rest of the series at some point, but if you just like mysteries that might have some aliens in them, I think Sundiver is a really good read and it's really well done. Another book that I really enjoyed was Red Shirts by John Scalzi. I'm actually not a huge Star Trek person, but I know enough that made this book funny. It is a very, I guess I would, it's probably, I don't know if it's satire, satire or parody. This is actually the only book by John Scalzi I've ever read, which shows what a bad science fiction reader I am, to be honest. I haven't seen a ton of Star Trek, but I know enough to get the concept behind this book, which is a very funny one, which is that in Red Shirts, there is a group of ensigns who are new to whatever the spaceship is called, and they start noticing that whenever the three leaders of the ship go on an away mission to a planet, one of the ensigns or lower ranking characters always ends up getting killed horribly by some sort of monster. So obviously the title and the idea behind this book comes from the fact that in Star Trek, um, the lower ranking characters that don't have names but were wearing the red uniforms are always the ones that would get killed off for dramatic effect. And that term red shirts has become kind of just a trope in fiction to describe how uh, lower ranking characters who aren't important just get killed off to raise the stakes. So this book is definitely more of a parody. It's pretty funny. There is in the end some breaking the fourth wall, some interdimensional travel. I don't really know what to say about it other than that it's funny and that I really enjoyed it. The last book that I'm going to recommend is a book that I recommend a lot in case anybody ever decides to read it. That is Anathem by Neil Stevenson. So this book came up in the tag video that I did with my husband recently, where I said that he was the only one I had ever gotten to read this book. My best friend pointed out to me that she had in fact read Anathem, she just didn't like it. So I'm giving credit to her. She did make it through the whole thing, even though she apparently didn't like it. And it's a pretty long book, so I, I really appreciate that. I'm sorry that she didn't like it. This is probably the most difficult to read book on this list. Most of the others are more on the light side. It is set in a world where all the intellectuals have been cloistered in these monastic communities where they live a life that is very low technology. So all the scientific or intellectual work they do is pretty much purely theoretical. They don't have the use of any technology. So there are a lot of philosophical dialogues and discussions about quantum this and that. And it is a little bit hard to get through at times, but it's also really, really interesting. At the beginning of the story, a foreign object, maybe a spaceship is seen orbiting the planet and it is being hidden by the um, powers that be, you know, the government. And a lot of changes start happening because of that. It's a pretty long read. 
and it goes through a very long journey. You end up in a very different place than you started, but I find that journey to be really, really rewarding. There's also a lot of made up language and terms that Neil Stevenson uses in this book, but you do start getting a feel for it after, you know, maybe a few hundred pages. There's also a glossary in the end if you're lost, but honestly, most of the words are very similar to or are drawn from actual words. So even if you don't know exactly what they are, you get a feeling that's evoked by the word that he invented about what it means. So this remains one of my favorite books. I've read it several times. It definitely takes some effort to get through, but I find it to just be really, really rewarding. So out of all the books on this list, this one is definitely the chunkiest and the most challenging, but hopefully somebody out there will decide to give it a try. Actually, it's pretty well reviewed. I think it has a good rating on Goodreads. So it's just the people I know that don't really like this book. So I hope that you got some good recommendations from this video. Let me know if there are any other science fiction books based on this list that you think I would really enjoy or should check out. And I would love to know if you read and enjoy any of these books.